No. Nick did not redeem himself. The first hour, he said, are you watching the game tomorrow? And I said, bro, you do not watch football. And then he said, tonight, the game is at 1 o'clock. Are you a Browns fan? Ain't Browns fans in this house? Amen. That's why you're here at the 10, because you're like, I'm not missing the you know, free game, whatever. Uh, if you're new, my name is Mike. Thanks for being here. Uh, man, that song we just sang, super powerful, isn't it? When we talk about faith and stepping out in faith, um, it really has this idea of there's no railing to grab. Um, there's no floor to catch you. There's no net to catch you. Uh, that Jesus is the railing. He is the floor. He catches you, man. Um, that has nothing to do with what I'm preaching about today, so I don't know what that means. I went over the first hour. I cannot go over this hour. Anyway, uh, if you got your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 18 um, is where we're going to be. Luke chapter 18, if you're uh, new here, don't have a Bible, it'll be on the Sky Bible behind me, and so you'll find it there. But uh, if you got one, go ahead and grab Luke chapter 18 is where we're going to be hanging out. Um, and so uh, one, one of the things, we're going to be in a series the next five weeks, uh, Friends into Family, and what that means, how we do that. Uh, I've been pretty fired up all week about this passage, and I got 35 minutes on the clock to preach seven verses, and I need about an hour, so we're going to get going. So have you ever uh, in your life uh, believed or heard the lie uh, that life is about you, um, that you should make life about you, that you have a truth and you should live that truth, and the more you live the truth, uh, the more satisfaction you will have. Uh, you and I are told this lie over and over and over again uh, throughout our life, and then you'll start to believe it, um, that, man, you should be the center of attention, that you should get everything you've ever hoped and dreamed, and that when more things happen uh, that you want them to go your way, the more they do, then the more happy you are. So really, um, what Jesus does is he takes that, um, and he flips it on its head, and he says, hey, no, 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 there's a different way uh, to follow me and to have a life of satisfaction. And the way I'll start this out this morning is that our greatest sacrifice will lead to our greatest satisfaction. Um, that's why we talk about these vision packets over there and, and what we're asking. Um, we're less concerned, I'm less concerned about um, how much uh, people get involved. I'm more concerned about um, the amount of people who participate, uh, meaning those who will serve, those who will join a group, those who will give. I, I'm way more concerned about the amount of people uh, percentage-wise because we're saying, hey, um, we just want some people who are ordinary people who will say, hey, I, I want to lay down a sacrifice in the natural realm and see God use it in the supernatural, that he uses ordinary people, amen? And Jesus does, says this in uh, Matthew 23, 11. He says this, the greatest among you shall be your servant. You see, over and over and over, he would have to teach this on three separate occasions because these guys, they're just like you and I. They're kind of boneheads. They can't figure it out. And he says, hey, I'm going to teach it over and over and over again. You have to be a servant if you want to become great. He flips it on its head and says, hey, you can't live for yourself. Uh, you have to live for me. Have you ever had a moment where you're, you're having a conversation and you look at someone and you're like, how did you not know that? Um, I think Jesus is teaching this over and over. Hey, how did you not know servanthood comes before being great? It is the pathway to greatness. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my wife and I were watching a show. It was on Netflix. It was a football show. And uh, as they were, they were talking about the Super Bowl. And, you know, we're watching it. And my wife has the audacity to look at me. And she said, what's the Super Bowl? <laughs> and I was like, babe, you know, and, and, not, and not to dog her, but we've hosted seven different Super Bowl parties <laughs> at our house. I was a youth pastor for years. We hosted outreach events for the Super Bowl, right? And I was like, babe, babe what happened there? How did you not know that? She's like, I didn't know that was like the big one, you know? Um, so there's some things you just, you don't know, and someone has to say, hey, how did you how did you not know? And that's kind of like these family cards right here. If you pull that slide up for me. Um, these things here, uh, this is the heartbeat of our church. If you uh, come here um, and you don't do anything, you don't give anything, you don't get involved in a group, you don't serve, I would still say, hey, do this first. Because here's what our, our church is all about. We want to see friends become family. We want to pray for them. We want to invest into them on a significant level. Um, this quote here, by C.T. Studd is really the heartbeat of why I wanted to start 539 and what God, I think, he's going to do here. It says this, some wish to live within the sound of church or chapel bell, and I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. 
And for you to know, that's me. Like that, I want to get in the trenches. I want to see the messy. I want to see God do something only he can do. That if you come here and uh, you have complaints, which I'm sure you do. You got stuff maybe you don't like. You know, there's things maybe I said you don't like. Someone came up to me afterwards and said, you said bro from the stage. And I was like, oh. Um, you know, hey, what, what, what don't you like or what happened? So here's what's important to know. We center everything, everything around being a hospital for sinners, not a hotel. And really all week, all week. And Pat, through this whole series, I'm praying this for our church. If you've been coming, if you're getting plugged in, here's the, the, the point. If you're not careful and you're part of our church, you can feel leveraged, not loved. You can feel dragged, not served. You can feel preached at, not heard, right? And so my, my prayer all week has been, Lord, I want a people who feel loved over leveraged. There's none of that mess that feel heard more than preached at, that feel served more than dragged or any of that mess, that we would be a hospital for sinners, that we would center around, okay, God, what do you want from our life? How, how are we going to do this thing, and how would you give us wisdom to do this? So if you're ready for the word, say, I'm ready. My intro was way too long, and Luke chapter 18 is where we're going to be. Um, I've titled today's message, Bridge or Barrier. Um, and speaking of bridge or barrier, 77 and 76 interchange, when is that mess done? That big bridge, or it's a barrier right now, don't drive that way, either way. Let's jump in. Uh, Luke chapter 18. Verses 35 to 37, if you'd pull it up for me, it says this. As he drew near Jericho, Jesus, a blind man, was sitting by the roadside begging and hearing a crowd going by. He inquired what this meant, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, it gives a similar story. This guy's name is blind Bartimaeus. I can't spell Bartimaeus, so I just call him Bart. Today, this is going to be blind Bart. That is his name. Um, we don't know how long he's been there. Uh, we don't know how he got there. We just know he's blind and he's begging. Uh, that's what he does for a living, as far as we know. Jesus is walking along. His primary ministry at this point is teaching people, teaching people that he is not just for the Jews. He's not just for the select religious elite. He's for everybody. Amen. That he's for all people. And as he is, he's on this journey. He's going on a crowd, inquiring what this meant. And then the blind man has an ear, and he hears Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Have you ever needed God's attention in your life? And at what lengths did you go to get it? Sometimes you, we're going to talk about this all for, for the remainder of our time, of like, hey, have you ever just been desperate for God? Um, we'll talk about it this way. Desperation determines urgency. When you need something, it'll put a fire in you. Uh, when you need something from your parents, right, kids, if you need something from your grandparents, if you need something from somebody, it'll stir in you something. And, and here's what's true. The more desperate you are is the more urgent you'll be, amen, that sometimes you just need to realize, hey, okay, okay, what, what's happening here? It is a gift from God that the blind man is blind and he knows it, is it not? It's a gift from God, you and I, when we're spiritually blind and we realize it. Ever been blind or had a blind spot and you can't see it? What a tragedy, right? It's a gift that he knows he's blind, actually blind. And then aside from that, he can hear who's his name? Jesus. Hey, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Here's what we're going to do to illustrate this. I want everyone go ahead and close your eyes. Uh, bow your head, close your eyes, just to illustrate this for us. Um, you can quiet yourself just between you and the Lord. I want us to step into Bart's shoes. I just want you to step right into his shoes. We don't know a lot about him. I want you to imagine this is all you know, darkness. Um, you, you, there's probably a lot of anger. Begging is your life, the quality of your life. Is, is garbage. Um, you, 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 you've tried family. They've, they're, they're tired of you at this point. Um, friends, you've tried them calling out. They're, they're tired of you as well. They don't help you anymore. The people who used to help you when you were crying out don't anymore. Uh, you feel like a burden. You, you, you've tried everything, and the only thing you know is darkness and begging. You're, you're hungry. You're angry. You're depressed. 
you have no idea what God wants from you. The, there's no one to call. There's nowhere to go. Your, your daily routine is to feel your way to the temple and find it there and find that the senses you have of feeling and hearing to a crowd. Um, you get to a crowd, and, and the only time as you sit there and you beg, you beg, you do anything you can, you leave out something for money that you can't count, you don't know if anyone steals from you, and your quality of life is right here. As your eyes are still closed, I'm going to keep reading the passage. I want you to hear this, not see this. I want you to hear this. And he cried out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Go ahead and open your eyes with me. Here, here's what, how this plays out. Think about this. He catches an ear that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And when he does, and sometimes when you read the Bible, if you're not careful, you'll just read it. It says, he cried out, Jesus. I'm not trying to hurt your ears. I'm sorry I'm loud anyway and I have a microphone. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You can probably tell he's, he, he's sitting there begging. I bet he's trying to stand up and he's crying out and he's screaming. There's a desperation there. We'll talk in a second. If you underline and highlight in your Bible, circle son of David, circle Jesus of Nazareth. I'll come back to that. Have mercy on me. And those who were in front, what did they do? Rebuked him, telling him, be quiet. You should be silent. What are these guys doing? He's for everybody. Can you imagine the disciples at this time? They're like, shh, he's busy. He's doing stuff. Jesus, doesn't he got a lot to do? Doesn't he got a crowd to preach at? Doesn't he got places to go? And they told him, be silent. But guess what? He doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. And he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's how um, I'd like to illustrate this. A lot of times when you come to church and you're involved, or maybe you've been in a group, and maybe for some of you this has happened before, maybe it's happening right now, maybe it's going to happen in the future. If you're not careful, you're in the crowd, you're in the crowd, and you feel alone. Tell me Blind Bart doesn't feel this way. A crowd of people, I guarantee there's thousands pressing in on him on the side of the road at Jericho, guaranteed. And as he's sitting there, he's crying out. And, and it's, I'll ask this question. Are you in the crowd crying for a personal encounter? And sometimes, what's it say in the passage? He cried out and they told him to be what? Silent. Have you ever cried out to God and you got nothing in return? Have you ever cried out to God and, I mean, it's a shame that the people in front are the most likely to push you to the back. Those who are in front, the disciples, those who have been with him, the people in front, we're going to talk in a second, they silence him. But a lot of you, you are, man, we're going we're gonna to hit on this. You're in the crowd. You're crying out for a personal encounter. You just want to talk to the guy. You just want his ear for a minute, and all you get is silence. I'm going to preach a message in November about the silence of God and the purpose of that. And it's not, a, it's not like a cute, fun thing to be a part of. But when you get silenced by God or from God, a lot of times you'll cry out one time. But what does Blind Bart do? He cries out a second time because there's faith in that. In this next question, who have I shut up that's shouting for the Savior? A lot of you are like, that's aggressive. Um, the reason is, is what's it say in the passage? They rebuked him. I don't think they were like, hey, Blind Bart, we'll be back. Uh, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. Jesus will make time for you. We'll get you in the schedule, maybe in July, but don't worry. Three o'clock, be prepared, we'll come back. No, what do they do? They rebuke him. I think it was a great, I think the crowd is like, hey, bro, shut up. Shut up. He's busy. He's got stuff to do. He's got people, I mean, we got the world to save. We're about to, right, remember the 20,000 fish, we're feeding all these people. He's about to die on the cross. He'll get to you, don't worry. And it's not, some of you, man, you just feel that way all the time. You feel like you get silenced. And I've asked the question, who have I shut up that's shouting for the Savior? Um, there's a few ways that I've thought about this and want to illustrate this. Um, there are some ways that you can know. Um, some signs if you have silenced someone who's shouting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull here from those of you who follow Jesus. Here, here's three or four signs. The first one is this. Interruptions annoy you. Um, they just annoy you. Like you're kind of busy. 
someone will have a question or it's a neighbor, uh, it's someone in your life, and the interruption is like, don't they know I have a life? You know, you're just kind of annoyed by it. Like, you're not involved at all. You're just like, eh. Second one is messy people and situations scare the death out of you. Like, oh, they might be sinners just like you. Oh, what are we going to do, right? Um, you're just kind of scared about messy. You're, you're kind of like, don't feel like you're going to have the answers and what that looks like. Um, the third one is this. You'd rather go around people far from God instead of to them or through them. Like, what if, we, what if it rubs off on us? Let's get away. Let's run. Hey, hey, newsflash, we're emergency responders. We run into fires, not away. That is the reality. So a lot of us, here's, here's a sign I'm silencing people. I see them. I see them. And I'm like, okay, dear Lord, please don't let them see me. Please don't let them see me. Right? Some of us, we do that. And then the last one's this. <clears throat> it is us versus them, not us for them, whoever they are. Them. It's, we look at them, and we think it's us against them instead of, oh, my word, how, how am I going to pray for them? How am I going to help them? Here's the, the last question and part of this passage. Am I a bridge or a barrier? Um, two, two stories real quick. A um, two, couple, two weeks ago, I was leaving my house, and I was going somewhere, going somewhere in my car, and my neighbor texted me, are you free? Now, I'm two miles from the house, so no, I'm not free. Uh, you know, I said, not right now. Um, you know, if do you need anything, no. And I was like, you know, three, five miles away, and I said, is it an emergency? Not, and they said, quote, not an emergency. The other neighbor just had questions about God. <laughs> that's what I do for a living. That's how, like, that's what I do. And at that point, I'll be honest with you, I'm six, seven miles away. And I'm like, oh, dear Lord, please forgive me. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't turn around. I didn't turn around. I went and did my thing because it was an interruption. And then I was doing my thing. And then I came back about an hour later. I followed up. I said, hey, is, you know, do you guys want to talk? What's the story? He said, oh, no, he went home. Uh, I handled it. <laughs> I was like, what'd you say? Now, full disclosure, I did a funeral for the guy's uh, family member recently, and he, he's, you know, trying to figure out faith and all that stuff. And I said, what'd you say? He's like, oh, bro, don't worry. I handled it. Uh, Romans 6.23, what'd you send his death? I handled it. Uh, Romans 10.9, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. And John 14, that there's a home in heaven for him. I was like, praise his name, right? <laughs> Um, I, at that point, I was a barrier, but how many of you know God will send someone to be a bridge when you screw it up, right? And at that time, I was like, thank you, Lord. Um, and I felt like this big, this big when I got back. And so here, and then, you know, two days ago, my daughter and I were riding our bikes around the neighborhood, and there was a guy I invited to church like in May, you know, it was a while ago. I saw him, and by the grace of God, I remembered his name. How many of you know, like, you know, remembering a name after a while is like God, like Holy Spirit just put it right there, bam, Tom, you know, and I said, Tom, you know, um, and I said his name, and then he said, you know, he started having questions about church, and I was like, hey, we would love to have you at church. Where you been? He might be here today. I haven't seen him yet, but he'll be here eventually, um, and this was Friday, and he said, honestly, man, I just really need the Lord in my life right now, and I was like, what are you doing right now? You know, I was like, hey, do you want to come to my house? He's like, no, 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 it's fine. I said, no, come, come, come. Because I was so convicted about the two weeks before, I was just like aware. I was like, someone mentioned God, and I'm like, you come over right now for dinner, get the coffee on. So here's, here's what's true. When you're a bridge, here's a few things. When you're a bridge, you can say things like this. And it's not like for the spiritual savvy people who are really smart and know all the verses. It's saying this. Here's a bridge. Hey, can I pray for you? Hey, would you sit with me? Hey, can I pick you up? Hey, do you have any questions? Probably don't have the answer to, but I know someone who does. It's Google. Um, do you do you have any? <laughs> um, that was sorry. Um, here's a here, here's what a here's what a barrier does. Man, they're just a lot of work. It's been investing and getting in the trenches in their life, and it's been five years, and I'm kind of tired. Like, is it a waste of time? God, what, what are we supposed to do? Hey, how do we invest into people? Not because we want something from them. God, help me. We want something for them. And in hell or high water, whether it's five weeks, five months, five years, or 50 years, we need to just share Christ and walk with people because they have souls. Amen? 
Like sometimes I just need reminded because I'm a bridge. I just get frustrated. How many of you know in Acts 16, um, the Apostle Paul, he plants a church. It's a beautiful story. Um, he started the church by casting out the demon uh, of a possessed girl in Acts 16. And it says he was greatly annoyed with the demon, not with the girl. And a lot of us, we're annoyed with people. We're annoyed with other interactions. And we need to realize our enemy is not the people. It's, you know, the enemy himself. And so, so this is for us. Am I a bridge or a barrier? Let's continue on in the passage. So he just cried out, son of David, twice. Verse 40, and Jesus stopped. Oh, my word. I could preach an hour on those three words. I mean, come on. Tell me that ain't crazy. He's walking along, crowds pressing in on him. Everything's going on. Tell me it's not loud. Tell me it's not crazy. There's things going on in the towns. There's music playing. Everything's happening. And our Savior stops. Isn't that wild? Eugene Peterson said this. God stops, he stoops, and he stays. There are times in life when you're crying out to God and you feel like he doesn't stop. All you get is silence. We're going to talk about this in a second. And he commanded him to be brought to him. So Jesus stops and he's like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's Bart? I can hear him. They're like, hear him? Right? Remember when Jesus, the lady, touched his, his cloak? And he's like, hey, whoa, 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 who touched my cloak? Because when the crowd's pressing in, how many of you know he has a heart for the one? He says, hey, bring him to me. And when he came near, he asked him, and I mean, this question is incredible. What do you want me to do for you? Some of you are like, that's a selfish question. Is it all about blind Bartimaeus? That's what the text says. What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my what? Sight. Jesus has an ear for the one when the crowd is overwhelming. The crowd demands every piece of him. They don't stop. They don't stop. Jesus stops when he hears a cry. How many of you know that's comforting? You've, you've cried out to God, and let's just get practical with this. You feel like a burden to God. You feel like, you're in, like you inconvenience him. Like he's kind of tired of your stuff. Some of you followers of Jesus, you're like, you think like when you confess again, he's like rolling his eyes. He's like, they're back again, back at the altar again, confessing it again. It's been 10 years. It's about time. Buckle up, get it together, pull up your bootstraps. You need to work harder, be more, do this, do that. Do. And, and you just think God is frustrated with you. And I'm here to tell you, he's not, he's not. He stops every time for the cry of his son or daughter. And a lot of you, you are frustrated to the max in your relationship with God because all you get is is silence. And you want to know why? I think it's because you stop at the first cry. I think you stop at that one individual thing. It says in Luke 18, uh, look up in your Bible, Luke 18, 1 to 8. They ask him a parable about prayer. And when they do, it says in verse 5, he says this, hey, I'm going to answer the persistent widow. You want to know why? Because she keeps bothering me. That's crazy. God's finally like, all right, I got to answer this request. Hold on, Holy Spirit, God the Father, we just wait. Bam. Um, think about that. Bothering, it says in verse 8, will he find faith on earth? Think about this. God has a heart for the one when the crowd is overwhelming. And this is also true. Those who give Jesus their full attention also get his. Um, this is just true. And there's a few caveats here, but the reality is this. Um, the loudest cry, or w let me say it this way. Help finish the sentence for me. The squeaky wheel gets the what? Only people over like 45 got that one. Everyone, <laughs> um, anyone, they're like, what's grease? Uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Every parent here knows the loudest cry gets the attention. Tell me that ain't true. Um, you, you're finally like, all right, I got to help out the kid. You know, so, so the loudest, those who give Jesus their full attention will also get his. It's just how it works. I think the faith, we're going to see in a second, the faith doesn't have any power, but it shows God, hey, I have it in here, and I'm pulling it to my mouth, and I'm showing it out in action. I won't stop until he stops. I'm going to keep coming back and back and back to him. And here's the question I want to ask, just like in the passage. What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want him to do for you? I mean, I mean look at it in the text. He asked him, verse 41, what do you want me to do for you? Um, 
God is not a genie in a bottle. It's not the lamp you get to rub, and finally he'll do it if you have enough faith. That's not how this works. Um, but, but in reality, let's say God comes down, preaches a better sermon. He comes up, he leads better worship. Um, he has better donuts. I don't know, but let's say this. God, God comes out and he asks you this after service. Hey, what do you want me to do for you? Follower of Jesus, you might say something along the lines of, man, my finances have been a disaster and I need help, God. Hey, would you mend the family? It's just a mess right now. We don't even know what to do. We're frustrated. My marriage is hanging on by a thread. I don't know if we'll make it to the end of the year. God, would you help us? Hey, what do you want me to do for you? Hey, my quality of life is diminishing away. I don't know how to handle this. God, would you help me? I just want to get super practical. For some of you, you might say, man, we've been trying to have a kid for five years, and I don't know why, why are we in this season right now. What do you want me to do? I think God cares tremendously about your concern in your heart. I think he has an ear for it. I think he's, he wants, and so he looks at the, the, do you think he knows what the blind man wants? Yes. Of course he does. You don't think he knows him? He's like, wait a minute. What do you want? Because he's asking it back. Blind Bart has cried out twice, and he wants to see, will the faith follow? Hey, what do you want me to do for you? In verse 42, it says this, and Jesus said to him, recover your sight. What's it say? Your that was so soft, has made you well. And immediately, um, sometimes when you read the Bible, if you're not careful, it's like, oh, he healed another blind guy. Pocket change for Jesus on a Tuesday. Um, that's not it at all. I, I mean, I, if I'm not careful, I've been reading the Bible for a while. I grew up reading it. It's like, oh, another leper, done. Bam, another blind guy, bam. Think about it, immediately. How many of you know God can heal someone like that? Immediately, he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God, and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Here's what we're going to talk about. The faith has no power in and of itself. Our prayer has no power in and of itself. It's the person we're calling to. It's where your faith is placed is where there is power. Bart knows, hey, I, I, I hear him. I, I got to call him, right? It, and just um, here's what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. Talk about this. Meeting Jesus changes who you follow and who gets the glory. Um, when we, last week, we had Story Sunday. Wasn't that incredible? Wasn't that, f I mean, fire. I mean, just so, sorry. Um, it was good. Uh, we had uh, Ryan, Sam, Kaylee, my dad sharing stories. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, you know what we'll do? We'll get excited about the story more than the Savior. What did they do? They glorified God. They gave praise to God. And so did the man. He follows Jesus. They don't interview Bart. They don't pull him up on a pedestal. They don't make him a leader. They don't do any of that stuff. What do they do? Look at what God did again. Amen? It, we need some people. We need some people that get more excited of what the Savior's doing more than the stories. Because here's also what happens. You have people like you and I. We want to hear like a really, really good story. We want a good one. And I'm kind of like, hey, if you have become a follower of Jesus from death to life, you have a good story. I don't care what anyone tells you. I don't care the lie you believe. You grew up in church. You got saved at four years old. Bam, Atawanas, and you've been following Jesus since. How many of you know that's a fire story? Right? And so some of you, you just forget that your story is not about you. It's about God and what he's doing. All the people, they look at it and they say, man, look at what God did. Look at what he did again. I got to transition because I'm running out of time again. <clears throat> Here's what we need to do. We need to call on his name. Um, would you pull up that slide for me, Caleb? Call on his name. It says in Luke 38, or 18, 36, I told you Jesus of Nazareth. You circle that. 38 and 41. Jesus, what's it say? Help me out. Son of who? David. Yeah. He doesn't say Jesus of Nazareth. A few important things. I would assume Bart goes to the temple every day to beg. I think he does. And I think since a little boy, he's heard story after story after story about the son of David. Um, and some of you, as you come in today, when, when God calls your name and when you call his name, how many of you know a father has an ear for a son or daughter? Last week at the 10, I stepped out here for a second and I heard a baby losing their mind. And I looked at Denise, I was like, that's Ezra, that's my son. We have 100 kids down there. And I was like, that's him, isn't it? And then my wife runs out and they're like, that was Ezra. How many of you know, 
because that's, that's, that's my son. Right when he was born, they said he has strong lungs, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I knew my son's call. How many of you know God's, Jesus, he's walking, he stops, command him to be brought to me. I think he goes, wait a minute, that's my son. I think Bart has been sitting there his whole life, and he said, wait a minute, Jesus, son of David? You mean the son of David? That's my dad. That's my dad. Hey, I, I need the son of David. He didn't call Jesus of Nazareth. He's not a teacher. He's not a rabbi. He's not here to save the world. He's here to save me. He's here to save me. Here's what it says in Isaiah 42. If we had time, we could break this whole thing down. Isaiah 42 says this, just a portion of it, teaches about the son of David. He says this, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind. I think Bart is sitting there and saying, if that's him, I can see. If that's him, he will open my eyes. And how many of you know, you reach a point when you're just tired of being tired. You're just tired of hearing silence. You're tired of being pushed. You're tired of being down. You're tired of being out. And how many of you know, he calls out, that's my dad. He can open my eyes. Jesus stops and he says, command him to be brought to me. That's my son. Would you get my son over here right now? Listen, here's what's so, so significant about this passage and a call for us and a command for you and I. I think a lot of you come in today and you're just tired. Your spiritual, the quality of your spiritual life is empty. You don't get anything at church anymore. You don't get anything in the word anymore. You've been silenced for a while. And here's what's important. The command is this, to call on his name. To call on his name. I think, the, I think Bart, I, I mean, just think about it. He, he's sitting there and he's like, that, that's my dad. He can help me. The son of David, if that's him, he will respond. And a lot of us, we cry out one time. We cry out one time and we give up. And I think the faith, you reach a point in life when you're so tired, you're so exhausted, you've been through so much crap in your life, you don't care who hears you. You don't care. You don't care who sees you. The guy's been sitting there. He's probably embarrassed. He's done with all that. He's done. He's like, I don't care. I don't need a sermon. I don't need a song. I don't need anyone. I just need Jesus. I just need him to heal me. I need him to help me. God, would you give me the grace to see that I am blind and without you, I need a savior of the world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this text. We thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you for this man, the blind Bart, Lord. We just pray that we would have a desperation for you. And God, for those in this room, and they've been following you for a long time, and they feel flat, just so spiritually flat. They feel like they have been in a season of silence. I pray that they would hear your voice today, that they would silence everything else around them, and they would cry out to you, and we would see it in our faith. And for those in this room, you've, you've never followed Jesus before. This whole thing is new for you. You've been coming here for a while. A friend dragged you, whatever the case is. And you need to call out to Jesus. It says in Acts 4 that there is salvation in no other name except at the name of Jesus. It says in Romans 10, 13 that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if that's you today and you need to call out for salvation, you are the reason we started this church. People who need to call out for salvation. So wherever you're at, if you're here, if you're in overflow, if you're online, wherever you're at, would you just cry out to him right now in this moment? Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to come into your life. Would you put your faith and trust in him? As we just talked, you're so scared about what faith is, and we sang that faith, there's no railing to grab. You're taking this step, trusting he'll hold you. And so if that's you today and you're making that decision wherever you're at, would you just throw your hand up right now by the expression of your faith? and say, I'm calling out to Jesus for salvation right where I'm at. I need him in my life. Awesome. Anyone else? You've been having decisions all morning. Amen. Anyone else? You'd say, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this morning. God, you've been so, so, so good to us. God, we thank you for the cross, and I pray that at our church we would be a church that glorifies you. And all the people, when they say that, we would give you the glory and we'd walk by faith. Heavenly Father, we give this time to you. We are thankful. We pray this in the powerful, powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, 
Amen. I want to thank you guys for being with us. Please grab a vision packet and head outside to meet some community group leaders. We'll see you next week.